How we doing, friends? Thought I'd start off uh, back in my studio uh, for this session, but I thought I'd start off with a little song for us all, if that's okay with you. Ain't walking in the shadow of another man. Won't find me chasing any kitchen trends, and that's all right. Top shirt among the Sunday best. I'm a dirty pair of boots under a wedding dress, and that's all right. Yeah, that's right. Don't you find me irresistible? I'm an original. Woo! All right. I'm an original, baby. That's what I'm talking about. That's really what we're going to be talking about today. You know, that song, gosh, we wrote that song a couple of years ago. And um, it was when we were, we were stuck in Vegas for a week, of all places to be stuck, right? We were stuck in Vegas for a week and uh, we were on our way out to record the last record that we had done with Big Kettle Drum. And um, also out to, to see our friends at Original Grain. Uh, Original Grain, uh, Andrew and Ryan Beltran, uh, the owners, two brothers of a watch company that I just, I fell in love with because they're original, because they knew their black sheep values and they use them to design and manufacture the most incredible wood and steel watches you've ever seen. And so for me, I always want to go and meet those types of people. And now Scott Young, their lead designer, um, has joined the crew there. And again, pushing forward on purpose, just like Todd Vandekrijk at, at Milliken. It's one of the reasons that we've been close for many years now is because I watch him take what matters most to him, align it to what matters most to Milliken, and push it to a market that understands. So to me... It doesn't get any better than that. So first and foremost, I can't believe how many people jumped on to see that last uh, session that we had done. I, I think I just looked before I, I jumped online here, and I think it was like 13,000 people jumped on to learn how to design on purpose. And that to me is very, very exciting. So I see a lot, a lot of people already on from all over the place. Uh, we've got Kansas in the house. We've got Tampa Bay in the house. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love to see it when you guys really want to engage. I see a bunch of people who said they've done the homework already. And that makes me even happier. The teacher in me is very excited. So can we talk for just a second about black sheep values, right? The whole idea of what we are going for, what we were shooting for in that last session was to identify our black sheep values, right? So we know that we all possess a flock of five black sheep values. So let's talk for just a second and remind ourselves that a black sheep value is a value that cannot be changed, right? It's those things, those personal core values that no matter what someone says to us, no matter how much they want to influence us or change us in some way, shape or form, we simply cannot be moved. We cannot be made into something that we are not just like a black sheep's wool. And so we all got sent home after the last session with, uh, you had an opportunity to download a worksheet, right? You had a worksheet that looked something like this. And on this worksheet, there was a whole bunch of personal core values for you to sort of take a look at. That was sort of step one, a little surface dive to try to find what your black sheep values really are, right? So we know that we had what I'm gonna call the black sheep values worksheet. And the whole point of that worksheet, the whole point of the worksheet was to make sure that we can separate what's really important from the things that are our non 
negotiables. That was what the goal was, right? And so when we start to look at that, when we start to see and understand exactly the difference between those things is when things get interesting, right? So if you looked at your worksheet, you saw there's 100, 125 or so commonly held core values. So what I wanna know is this, if you did the worksheet and you circled more than 30 words, say yes, give me a yes in the comments. If you circled more than 30 words as these are things that I deem really important in my life. And, and the interesting thing when we start to look at that, right? When we start to understand what that's all about is that there are so many things in our life that we deem really important, but at the end of the day, they are not, they are not non-negotiables. And so if you're somebody who circled at least 30 of those words, that's not good or bad. It's not, um, right or wrong, all that that means is that you've got some work to do to separate the things that are important from your black sheep values. That is really what that says. That's what that's all about. And so when you start to funnel them down, right? Because the whole point of that worksheet is to get you to, to identify all of these things. And then we start to narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow, and we get them into five buckets of similar themes, right? And then the whole goal from that is you can only choose one value per bucket. And that gives you your initial flock of five. That's how it's supposed to go. But for many of us, we struggle we struggle with the exercise. And we do because we find out that there are so many things that we think are really important in our life. And whenever we do this, whenever I'm doing a workshop live with people, I ask how many people, show of hands, how many people circled over 30 words? And 90% of the hands go up in the room. And then I simply say, this is what crippling anxiety and depression looks like. <laughs> And that's because when you have so many things that are important, it's simply impossible to honor them all. But we try and we try and we fail and then we feel bad and then we invite feelings like shame. And before you know it, even if we were successful in 29 of the 30, we still beat ourselves up over the one that we didn't honor. So how do we stop that? How do we avoid that happening again? We avoid that by identifying that flock of five because it's, it's completely manageable to honor five black sheep values in your life every day. And if you're gonna design on purpose, there is no other way. So let's talk about that. What does that really look like? So, oh, I don't know why we've got this here. Little lockup. Oh, well, we won't go to there. So, this is what we need to know then. With regards to our black sheep values, the worksheet is a surface dive, right? Sort of helps us start to identify those things that matter most. But the other way that I like to talk through what uh, identifying your black sheep values looks like is your favorites. You see, there's a reason that we all have favorites. And that's because our favorites connect our head and our heart. In our head and our heart, when those two things connect, it engages our limbic brain where all of our emotional long-term memory is stored. And that's where things start to really become catalysts for behavior, right? And so when it comes to favorites, what I wanna know is this. In the comments right now, give me one of your top three favorite movies of all time. What's one of your top three favorite movies of all time? Now I've been asking that question for about 18 months and the number of different answers that I've gotten has been um, incredible. And some of the answers have been really telling when it comes to identifying the things that truly resonate with us. And so I'm gonna look right here and you see some of these. Debbie says that one of her favorite movies of all time is The Princess Bride. Now, Debbie, you're in good company because Princess Bride happens to be the number two 
favorite movie that I ask when I ask that question, it is the second most common answer I get. When you start looking here now, look at all these things happening right here. We've got Nicole says Anchorman. That says a lot about you, Nicole. Um, we've got uh, Rich with uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Denise says Garden State, right? Gosh, look at all these. But this right here, let's go right here. Richard says Shawshank Redemption. And that happens to be the number one answer that I have gotten over the last almost two years of asking that question. What I want you to notice right now is in that chat, look at all of the different answers that people are coming up with. And what I want you to know is this, what those favorites say about them, these, these movies provide us breadcrumbs to the things that matter most to us, right? That is really um, why I asked the question. And if we were there right now, if we were sitting in the same room, I'd ask you to, in 30 seconds or less, give me a summary of what the movie's about uh, and, and the words that you choose to describe your favorite movie start to give me hints as to the values that you hold most dear. So when you look, I mean, we've got Sound of Music. Um, Phil <laughs> says, Uncle Buck, Phil, I'm gonna offer some special counseling to you when this is all over. Um, it's a great movie, but good Lord, man, Uncle Buck. So this is, this is what I want you to know. If you remember, I told you last week what my flock of five black sheep values look like, right? And I actually have six. So my, my six are creativity, hope, impact, empathy, family, and authenticity, right? Those are my six black sheep values. My favorite movie, of all time is Happy Gilmore. And I think that should tell you everything you need to know about me in this moment. But when I first started to look and wonder why Happy Gilmore was my favorite movie, I thought at first that it was one of two things. Number one, I love stupid humor. I love idiotic humor. And so I'm like, Adam Sandler, say no more, right? The second reason is because Adam Sandler and I are from the same hometown. We went to the same high school. He's a couple years older than I am. Um, but I thought maybe it's just some love for, for hometown boy done good, right? But then I identified my black sheep values and I retook a look at that movie as to why it's my favorite. So let's just explore that for a second because I know this is what you're going to do with yours. So you remember my first black sheep value was creativity. Do you guys remember what Happy Gilmore did when he hit a golf ball? I mean, he ran up to it and took a giant swing at it. It was crazy. Was it creative? Uh, yeah, you could say that. My second black sheep value was hope. So what I want you to answer for me now in the comments is this. If you've seen Happy Gilmore, what was Happy Gilmore's lifelong dream was to do what? What was it? that he spent so much time trying to accomplish, but he never actually did. Do you remember what that was in the movie? What was it that he was trying so hard to accomplish? Because that, I recognize the want to have that hope for something, right? For me, yes, Mackenzie says it, she's got it right. He wanted to play professional hockey. That is exactly what he wanted out of his life. Did he ever make it? He did not, right? I grew up wanting to play professional baseball. That was my goal. I had no plan B. I got hurt. Everything changed. Everything changed, right? And so for me, I recognize holding on to hope. Second black sheep fed already by watching that movie. My third was impact. If you guys remember, Happy Gilmore joins the professional golfers tour and all of a sudden, people come out of the woodworks to see him play. They got all cut off jean shorts, which I'm not gonna judge, but if you've got a pair of cut off jean shorts, you need to burn them now. This is not 1973, friends. Burn the shorts, okay? Those cut off jean shorts, those, the, the beer helmet, right? These are not your typical country club goers. Did he have an impact into the areas of which he was touring? Absolutely. My third sheep being fed, right? 
creativity, hope, impact. What's hap What's next? It's empathy. It's empathy, right? Did he ever make it to play professional hockey? No, he did not. Did I ever make it to play professional baseball? No, I did not. I have walked a mile in those shoes. It resonates with me. So yeah, I get it. I'm four for four. My next was family. Do you guys remember why? Why did Happy Gilmore join the professional golfers tour? There was a very specific reason. And if you remember that reason, you'll understand why it fed another one of my black sheep values. Because the reason that Happy Gilmore joined the PGA Tour was to raise money for one reason. He needed the money because he needed to save his grandmother's house, right? It's exactly right. God, Mackenzie's on fire to save his grandmother's house. Yes, it was being repossessed by the IRS for back taxes. So I'm five for five. There's only one left and that's authenticity. My favorite scene in the movie outside of the endless love scene when they are at the rink and the guy's singing with the silhouette of endless love, right? That wasn't it. But my favorite scene in that whole movie is he's asking out the uh, PR agent for the PGA Tour and uh, played by Julie Bowen uh, from uh, Modern Family. And he says, maybe you'd like to go out sometime for dinner. And she looks at him and says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't date golfers. And he looks at her and says, well, that's okay, because I'm a hockey player. That is a mic drop, boom, mic drop moment. I loved it. To know who you are, even when you're not doing something that you feel you were meant to do. He still knew who he was and that resonates more than anything. That's authenticity at its deepest fiber, right? So for me, it fed all of my black sheep. Of course, of course it's going to be one of my favorite movies. That's the reason why. And when you start to look now, when you start to look as to why you have these favorite movies, you're gonna to start to realize it says something about the values that you possess. Those flock of five things, you're gonna see hints as to what they actually are. It happens with music as well right? We have favorite songs. For me, give me one of your, in the chats right now, give me one of your favorite songs of all time. And this is what I love about this question, is that music affects us in such an incredibly powerful way, right? When we are searching for what matters most to us, there is not a lot of things in the world that move us like music does. Even that sort of low music bed you hear going on right now, do you think that is unintentional? <laughs> that is not unintentional. I am doing that because I'm trying to create an experience to make you feel something, right? That's why that's there. That's why it's so important. And so for me, music says, again, a lot about what matters most to us. You look now and you start to see, dream on. Oh gosh, right? Dream on, come on, some Aerosmith there. Don't stop believing, Jamie's crying. Oh, look, we got Purple Rain. Lisa, come on, baby, you're killing me right now. Of course, Purple Rain. If I had some chaps, I'd like some right, uh, right there, right? If I had some chaps right now, I would be wearing them in honor of the Purple One himself, I would. So for me, when we start to look at what our favorite songs are, it, again, it starts to tell us what matters most to us. So when you start to look at your favorites, when you look at this sheet, you can start to connect the dots from the values that matter to the feelings, to the memories that we have with regards to our favorites. So you start with that worksheet, you confirm by looking at some of your favorites because the whole point of identifying those black sheep values is so that you can start to develop your own original voice. I like to call it your oove, right? Your oove, it sounds good. Find your oove, your own original voice. That has to happen if you were going to design on purpose. It has to. Because otherwise, you're only going to design things that you've been influenced by over the course of your life. 
We don't want that. It's okay to be inspired by other people's work, but we need to identify those things that matter most so they show up in our work. We don't want people to believe that we are capable. We want to prove we've done it. And that happens when you define those black sheep values. It's what allows you to become a conscious creator, right? That's the whole reason we do it. Being a conscious creator means we're deliberate with our intention. It means we say if creativity, hope, impact, family, uh, authenticity, and empathy are the things that matter most to me, and I'm a designer, you should see that in my work. Because I'm asking myself that question while I'm designing. How can I incorporate this in my work? You know, I love the idea, that thought. There's a, there's a speaker, her name is Sally Hogshead. She is phenomenal. She's an, she is like a legend, right? She's been around a long time and she's done amazing things. And I was listening to a podcast uh, with her as a guest several weeks ago, a few months ago now. And one of the things that she said, one of the things she said to me uh, that, that I got from that podcast that really resonated was this. When you are pushing out your marketing material, right? When you are showing somebody your book of business, when you are showing somebody your portfolio of what you have done, if you took your name off of the book, would they know it's yours? Would they know it's yours? If you have not developed and found your black sheep values, how are they possibly going to know it's yours? It's why I have, look, I got, I got black sheep tattooed everywhere, everywhere you look. I got hats, I got socks, I got, it's all over the place because anytime somebody says black sheep values, I want them to think Brant Menzoir. I don't want them to have to see my name. It reminds me that I need to lead with them. That's why for me, I had it tattooed right here. I had it tattooed to my arm. So that every time I look down at my arm, I know that if I'm not leading with those black sheep values, how is anybody gonna distinguish between me and anyone else? They can't. I just sort of meld in with the 500 other sheep that all look exactly the same and that is not designing on purpose. That's not doing anything on purpose. So we've got to get to that point where we separate the things that are important from our non-negotiables, from those black sheep values. Then we've got to prove that they're real. We've got to look for evidence that they show up in our life, right? That to me is uh, incredibly important, incredibly important. And I look at, uh, there was, I did a session a couple of years ago with an incredible ethnographer named Paula Zuccotti. And she uh, developed this book called Everything We Touch. And she documented, she documented what people touched from the second they woke up to the second they went to bed. And at the end of the day, she compiled all those objects and she took one photograph and gave you sort of a snapshot, a 24 hours of a day in the life of that person. And they were different ages from like two to 92 in all different races, religions, and sexual orientations, and you name it. There was a, there was a, a cross section of humanity, right? And when you look at it, you go, gosh, you start to be able to forecast and see what matters to someone. Was there a yoga mat? What did they eat for food? Is health something that's important to them? Did they have any sort of hobby? Were they artistic? You start to look at those things because when she did it, I started to question my life. Did anybody see any evidence of the things I say matter most? And the truth was, I could say maybe at best. That's not on purpose. That's not living life on purpose. That's not designing on purpose. That's not creating on purpose. And so I had to start to be even more deliberate with my intention. And that's exactly, exactly what we're going to talk about next week is how do we move once we've found our black sheep values, we've proved that they're ours. How do we move past that into consciously choosing when and where they appear in our lives, how they appear in our creations? 
That's what comes next. We have a couple of minutes left before we stop. I want to make sure I have a chance to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, feel free to drop the question in the comments right there. I'm happy to sort of take a look at that uh, in, in the, the few minutes that we've got before we've got to wrap things up. But I have to tell you, uh, the fact that we've had so many people on watching and so many people afterwards uh, just makes my heart uh, sing that people actually care because right now, um, we're all sort of being forced to wing it in a lot of ways. And as we talked about last week, winging it is, is the antithesis of doing anything on purpose. So we, we find and discover these black sheep values. So when we're forced into a scenario where winging it is where everyone else is, is going, we can choose, we can choose to, to honor those black sheep values and still make decisions on purpose because we're making decisions that are in alignment with these black sheep values that we say matter most to us. That's really what it is. Um, Roxanne wants to know when the book is launching. Uh, it's September 29th. I know we still have a little bit of time in place, but unfortunately uh, the book industry is like the music industry where you record an album a year ago and it takes that long to get into the funnel, right? Rich, I love this. Rich says, no more winging it. That's right. That's exactly it. We don't want to wing it. You don't have to wing it. Winging it is a choice. It's a choice. But the only way to move past winging it is to discover these non-negotiables, these black sheep values, right? That's really what it's about. And that's why we're doing these sessions. So, you know, our first session together, we said, hey, what's the secret to designing on purpose? And the secret is that we have to understand there are these these set of values, this flock of five black sheep values that really make us an original. They are the at the very center, at the very core of who we are. This session was, how do you know what yours are? Well, you've got a worksheet that you can download so you can start some of that work. And you know now you need to confirm it by looking at your favorites. Do you see the things that you said matter most? Do you see those things in these favorites of yours, whether that's movies or songs? Heck, we even have favorite smells. We have favorite smells. My favorite smell in the world is lilacs. You know why? Because when I was a kid, every single time I pulled up to my grandmother's house, the first thing I smelled when I opened the car door were lilacs because she had this huge lilac bush on the side of her home. And so when I smell lilacs now, I immediately think of my grandmother and that to me, with family being one of my black sheep values, that smell triggers that black sheep value. That's how it works. That's how we know that they're real. So we've got this question here. Let's look at it. Um, how can one stay authentic when the internet has so many ideas thrown at us all the time? And as a designer, we are constantly searching for inspiration online or elsewhere. Okay, great question. Great question. Um, what I'm gonna say is this, if you're searching that hard online, it's because you haven't tuned in to what you have to offer. Because the truth is you've been exposed to things your whole life that you can draw inspiration from. That's why we need to discover those things that matter most. So don't be lured into what the internet says is the latest, greatest trend. That's what that song says straight up that I played, right? Ain't walking in the shadow of another man um, ain't going to follow any BS trends, right? I need to be an original, which means I can look and say, okay, I get what they were going for, but I need to look inward to those things that matter most for me to pull that out and offer it to the world. I need to make sure that it honors those things because that's what makes it mine and nobody else's. That's what allows you to take your name off of it and people still know it's your design. And if you think through the most influential designers that you can think of, you know who designed them without even seeing their name. There's a reason for that. And that's because they got so vulnerable that they were able to push those black sheep values through the design so that you don't need to know. No one has to say their name. You go, uh-huh, look at Frank Lloyd Wright. You're telling me that you can't identify a Frank Lloyd Wright house without knowing that it was had his name on it? Come on. We all know better than that. We look at it and we can identify it because those values come screaming through. And that's the goal and that's why we wanna do what it is we are trying to accomplish, which is discover those black sheep values. So listen, 
Super excited. I will go through here. I'm going to go through these and I will make sure that I answer them for you even when, when we stop here in just a second. So don't think that you're not going to get your answers uh, because I will make sure that you get them. Uh, in the meantime, if you didn't get a chance to do the worksheet last week, download it before next week because we're going to start to talk about how do we speak these things into existence because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where you separate yourself from the pack. That's where you become the black sheep in a sea of white sheep and people start to look to you first. And that is the goal. So until next week, my friends, this has been another incredible session. Thank you so much for tuning in. I truly appreciate it. I appreciate you. Have yourself a great weekend and we'll see you real soon. Na, 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 na,